Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Velocity Financial Incorporated second quarter 2020 earnings conference call. All participants are currently in a listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, you may send all conference specialists by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star and then one. To withdraw your questions, you may press star and two. Please also note today's event is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference call over to Chris Holtman, Chief Accounting Officer. Sir, please go ahead. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for participating in Velocity Financial Second Quarter 2020 Earnings Call. Joining me today are Chris Farrar, Velocity's President and Chief Executive Officer, and Mark Sapaniak, Velocity's Chief Financial Officer. Earlier this afternoon, we released our Second Quarter 2020 press release and the accompanying earnings presentation, which are available on our Investor Relations website. I'd like to remind everybody that today's call may include forward-looking statements, which are uncertain and outside of the company's control, and actual results may differ materially. For discussion of some of the risks and other factors that could affect results, please see the risk factors and other cautionary statements made in our communications with shareholders including the risk factors disclosed in our most, more recent, most recent annual and quarterly reports. Also note that the content of this conference call contains time-sensitive information that is accurate only as of today, and we do not undertake any duty to update forward-looking statements. We will also refer to certain non-GAAP measures on this call. For reconciliations of these non-GAAP measures, you should refer to the press release and earnings presentation on our investor relations website. Finally, today's call is being recorded and will be available on the company's website later today. I will now turn the call over to Chris Farrar for opening remarks. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for joining us on the call. Hope that everyone uh, is safe and healthy and all of your families are as well. Um, on our last earnings call, uh, I outlined three overriding principles that will guide us through this pandemic. Um, and just as a refresher, one, protect our employees and our shareholders. Two, help our small business owners uh, manage through the crisis. And then three, carefully manage capital and liquidity to ensure long-term success. I'm proud to say that we've been very successful executing on all three of these goals. We are still working remotely and have done our part to protect our employees and our communities where we work and live. Uh, in terms of our shareholders, we continue to manage the business and our balance sheet to create long-term value. Secondly, we helped many borrowers bridge the worst of the shutdown by offering forbearance plans to help them manage their cash flow. Lastly, we were able to issue long-term debt for all loans previously pledged to our warehouse lines at very attractive terms, which eliminated the mark-to-market risk that we faced. We're also very proud that we continue to enjoy strong support from our securitization investors through all market cycles. Looking forward, our team is eager to resume lending and our customers are indicating strong demand for our programs. Making the final preparations to accept new loan applications and execute our growth plans in the third quarter. I want to thank all our investors, employees, and industry partners for your continued support. Together, we will successfully navigate this environment and our, achieve our vision for the future. With that, um, we'll turn over to the presentation materials. Um, uh, as Chris mentioned, we've, we've got the uh, earnings deck, um, and I'll start on page three and just kind of kick us off with some of the highlights and then and turn it over to Mark to walk through some results and then, and then back to me to close. Um, first topic on, on page one, we had net income of $2.1 million for the quarter and core EPS of $0.17 cents a share. Um, we think this reflects the results of a resilient business model um, in, in obviously extremely challenging times. Um, later on, Mark will walk you through the mechanics, but uh, as a result of the pipe transaction, um, we declared a deemed dividend to those to the preferred common stock, which results in a non-cash 
adjustment from common equity to temporary equity. And Mark will walk you through all the details of that transaction in a bit. Um, in terms of production in the portfolio, um, continued to see strong resolutions of de delinquent loans. We're seeing good recoveries there, even in, in, in the depths of the crisis. Um, so we still see an active market, and we're a little bit surprised by how much activity was going on and was obviously a very strange time for everyone. Um, also, in terms of our forbearance plan, uh, about $331 million of loans were on some type of a forbearance plan at the end of the, the second quarter. And um, importantly to us, we've been monitoring how those folks are going to do post forbearance. And um, for the month of July, um, a little over 80% of those folks either made payments or paid their loan in full. So. We were very pleased with um, the performance coming out of the uh, out of the forbearance period, and we think it was really the right thing to do, and, and helped a lot of borrowers um, get through a tricky time. Um, in terms of net interest margin, uh, it's actually up quarter over quarter. Um, we did see a reduction in the yields from our total portfolio because of non-accrual loans, but there was an offset there from the uh, interest savings on our long-term debt that we paid down with IPO proceeds. So um, those two essentially washed. In terms of fin financing and capital, um, I mentioned that we paid off uh, our warehouse lines, um, two really good securitizations that we put announcements on earlier, and then um, uh, you folks all know about the, uh, the $45 million of, of convertible preferred stock that was issued as well to strengthen the balance sheet. Turning to f uh, page four, um, this is essentially just a bridge um, from core earnings to, to, to the gap loss per common share. Um, again, kind of the preferred dividend or deemed dividend, if you will, uh, it, it was the most material transaction. And um, I don't think anyone will be surprised by, by that. That's essentially just a transfer as a result of the, the dilution. Um, what we did do, just to be real clear, is is mark um, the, the uh, convertible preferred stock to its uh, full redemption value. So um, that, that's essentially what's driving this, you know, quote, unquote, deemed dividend. Um, the other item on, on, on the slide that we mentioned is the, is the COVID-19 reserve. reserve. Um, we run a pretty rigorous model. That model came back. Um, we sat down as a team and looked through the results. And um, the new updated forecast is for a more severe economic downturn and for a longer period. Um, I think it goes out a little over two years. So um, we, we, we've, we think we've got a very safe look at, at where we're going to be in terms of CECL, but that did uh, result in, in some increased reserve um, for the quarter. Uh, turning to page five, um, just again kind of summing up from, from the business perspective before I hand it over to Mark. Um, mentioned the two securitizations. We are in negotiations right now with some other counterparties for new warehouse um, financing that will all be non-mark to market. Um, so on a go-forward basis, uh, we want to take that risk out of the business, and we're, we have very good uh, dialogue going right now. Um, expect to have significant um, facilities closed here in the, in the third quarter. Uh, in terms of production, we uh, spent the, some of the downtime reworking our IT and our, some of our processes. We think we've got a better process coming out of the out of this crisis that will be more efficient and a little more streamlined for not only our customers but our internal uh, operations folks as well. We uh, are retraining on, on some of those changes right now and um, preparing to start accepting applications uh, early September. So very excited to get back uh, into the origination uh, mode again. Uh, and then lastly, on forbearances and lost MIT, I did mention how those, those loans uh, were performing. Um, we stopped uh, 
offering new forbearance plans at the end of June. Um, we did we did issue uh, some new forbearance plans uh, early in the in the third quarter that kind of spilled over, um, but by and large we're we're over that hump. Um, as a, on a go forward basis, it, it, anything that we do should be pretty small and relatively um, minor in comparison to what we've already done. So very happy to see um, folks getting back on their feet and resuming their payments. And um, obviously, we'll see that happen here again in, in uh, August and September. Then we sort of, the pig goes through the snake, if you will, and we should be over the hump with, with that process. And um, we're looking forward to, to refocusing on not only managing those folks going forward, but, but making new loans. So um, with that, I'll hand it over to Mark to, to take uh, you through the rest of this, this, uh, the deck. Thanks, Chris. And good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'd like to echo Chris's opening comments. I hope all of you and your families are staying uh, safe during this COVID pandemic. And like I am, looking forward to being able to go outside without masks for a change. So. Before we go into the page six of the deck, I just want to kind of follow up to what Chris was mentioning on the $2.33 kind of adjustment or loss per common share and give a little more explanation or detail on that. Uh, GAAP account, U.S. GAAP calls it a loss per common share. But you have to keep in mind when you see that word loss is not an operating loss. The company did not have an operating loss in Q2. Our net income was $2.1 million for Q2. If you add that to Q1, it's $4.7 million net income year to date. So there was no P&L hit as a result of this. It's also called a deemed dividend because no cash went out of the company. Um, what happened is in putting together the preferred stock transaction, the preferred stock transaction has an embedded redemption feature. When it has an embedded redemption feature, U.S. GAAP precludes us from classifying that as permanent equity because there's a chance it could get put back at a future date. So it goes in a category called mezzanine equity or temporary equity, which is on a the balance sheet, it's below liabilities and above common equity. So it goes into what's called mezzanine equity. And when it has a redemption value, you're really required to carry that preferred stock at its full redemption value. So the full redemption value of the stock is June 30th. It's $90 million. So the stock was actually out of the books to say like around $41 million. Because remember, we received $45 million in proceeds, but part of those proceeds is allocated to the warrants because we have stock, preferred stock, and warrants. The warrants are in permanent common equity because those are warrants that can only be exercised to buy common stock. They're not redeemable. So the carrying value of preferred stock was about 41, 42 million less the warrants, but we had to increase it up to the 90 million, which is the redemption value. So that, that 48, 49 million, actually it's a net of deal cost. The 48, 49 million is a reclassification out of permanent equity, paid in capital, up into temporary equity. It's really just a balance sheet reclass, because out of permanent equity into temporary equity. That's why I said it didn't go through the P&L. It's not really a loss on the P&L. Uh, and that carries the preferred stock at 90. However, under GAAP, when you're calculating earnings per share based on common equity, common shares of stock, any classification out of permanent equity into temporary is what's called a deemed dividend, meaning cash didn't go out the door, but it's a deemed dividend. And when you calculate the earnings per share, you have to take the actual earnings for the quarter, which we said was $2.1 million off the interest statement. It was our earnings for the quarter. And you have to reduce it by that reclassification amount that came out of common into temporary. So if you take the $2 million, let's say $48, $49 million that got reclassified, then you're saying, well, I've got a negative $47 million divided by 20 million shares outstanding. There's your $2.33, $2.33 a share loss. So we have to keep the loss in perspective. There is no operating loss. The company does not have a loss as a result of its operations, its resulting operations. It's more of kind of an accounting thing, the way U.S. GAAP and FASB requires you to classify it. So that's the pipe transaction in the 233. So I just want to make sure that everybody's clear on that. So now going back to the deck, on page six, in taking a look at our loan portfolio, uh, it's the combination of the HFS and HFI, Obviously, HFI out of the $2 billion portfolio, HFI as of June 30th was about a billion eight. The HFS was a much smaller portion, a couple hundred million. But take a look at the total portfolio. On the left-hand side, the portfolio composition, you see we ended at just under $2.1 billion. Uh, compared to the end of Q1, it was just a little over 2.1. So as you can imagine, the portfolio is fairly, fairly flat. We Remember, we had no loan originations in Q2. Operations were suspended in Q2. 
And again, because of the COVID crisis now, there's very little pay downs or payments happening as well. So you can see that the portfolio stayed pretty flat, the decrease of about 3%. And then the right-hand side just kind of shows the waterfall. On page 7, we look at our portfolio-related net interest income and our net interest margin. Our net interest income for Q2 was $18.6 million. That's compared to $21.8 million for uh, the first quarter. And, and our NIM, our portfolio-related margin, was 3.54% compared to Q1 of 4.18%. And again, as Chris mentioned earlier, uh, the margin is down uh, primarily because of the, the non-performing loans uh, going up. And the right-hand side, so we did get a pickup, though, that, that decrease in the in the amount of the, the yield. If you look at the top side, of, of the right-hand side, the loan yield, the decrease in the yield is due to the non-performing is going up, but we also got a decrease in our average debt cost. Uh, as we kind of mentioned, debt cost has been coming down. A lot of it's due to the pro rata structures. We said if we're going to do more of those and the sequential pay down, we're going to be picking up on the debt cost. You see that is happening. Debt cost has trended down over the last three quarters, um, but the yield is down as well due to the increase in non-performings, so the margin is down compared to Q1. On page 8, if we take a look at the biggest portfolio we have, the HFI loan portfolio, in terms of the non-accrual loans, we ended the quarter with just under 15% of non-performing and non-accrual loans compared to about 8% for the end of Q1. So as we said, the non-performing uh, is up. The one thing to keep in mind, we've always said our charge-off rate is very, very low compared to non-performings. A lot of that has to do with the low LTV, you know, the 65% LTV, which we've held consistently. Um, the, the high borrower FICO score on average, you know, personal guarantees. There's a lot of good reasons that the, the, the charge-offs have been low historically. And you see those charge-offs continue to stay low. You look at the right-hand side, you know, for the last three quarters on a quarterly basis, under 50 basis points in charge-offs in any one of those quarters. So although the non-performing has ratcheted up, charge-offs remain low. Uh, and we, we're kind of expecting our charge-off rate to be um, hopefully consistent going forward and kind of what we've had in the past based on the way our loans are structured. Going on to page 9, in terms of the CECL reserve, Chris had mentioned that we did take an increase to our loan loss reserve for Q2. Uh, the, the biggest part of the reserve was due to the economic forecast. I think we mentioned at the end of Q1 we use a model and we used a, a CECL stress scenario at the end of Q1 to kind of model the economic forecast, and we, we increased to just that CECL piece of it, I'm sorry, the COVID piece of it, by about $900,000 in Q1, and we used the COVID stress scenario again for Q2, and as you can imagine, the COVID stress scenario was a little bit more adverse for Q2 uh, because of the longer recovery period that was experienced during Q2 on COVID, the resurgence of kind of the second wave of the COVID virus, uh, businesses that were reopening now had to reclose again, so this, the model that we use, it reflected that, and so it was a little bit more, uh, instead of a, kind of an inverted V where it hit the peak and then came down quickly, it was more, the curve was more of an inverted U where that peak kind of extended a little longer, and so we felt the need to take a, an additional provision for Q2 based on that model. So at the end of Q2, we're now at a loan loss reserve of 5.2 million on our total portfolio, or 28 basis points, where at the end of, say, last year, we were at 13 basis points. So we feel that we've you know, sufficiently increase that reserve, uh, that, that it's, it's in a good position kind of based on where COVID is at now and based on the adverse scenario that we've run. And with that, Chris, I'll turn it over to you to go through uh, second quarter asset resolution activity. Great. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. Uh, back on 10, um, just a little more detail around resolutions. Um, on the roadshow, we emphasized how resolutions were really critical to us, that, that the main thing that we focus on, um, as Mark mentioned, was the higher non-accrual loans. Um, we, we get lower current yields, but our anticipation is that those recoveries will just be pushed out into future quarters, and we will get all of that contractual interest in back, as well as some of the penalties. So recoveries are, are really important for us. And um, you know, pleased to report again in Q2, strong recoveries. Um, in you know, kind of laid it out in detail here. Um, so it was, it was good to see that the markets um, continued to perform for us, even in some very strange times. Um, and 
those are the gains, uh, you know, 102 recovery uh, for the quarter. Uh, on 11, uh, just kind of wrapping it all up, uh, the real estate values have held up much better than I think a lot of people feared, and that, that's really helped us um, in speaking with our special servicing team. They're, uh, they're seeing, you know, properties being shown, uh, borrowers paying off, borrowers refinancing, um, healthy markets. Uh, just anecdotally, had a foreclosure last week in California that we went to the, the courthouse steps and was paid off in, in full by a bidder there. Um, and so starting to see things unthaw and, and markets continue to perform. So we think that's good for, for resolutions. Um, we've enhanced our staff in the special servicing department. We are, we're well prepared to, to handle this increase in delinquency, and we're on top of all of those borrowers and speaking with them and, and working through those assets um, and expect to continue to resolve assets favorably. And then lastly, in terms of profitability and growth, um, we think there's, uh, you know, some, some good opportunities here to, to drive higher income as we as we start to originate again. Um, opportunistically, we think we can blend in this environment at, at lower LTVs and higher coupons. So I think from an ROE perspective, it's probably very, rich, very attractive. Um, and so we'll see how that goes as we start to roll things out here. But we're, we're very optimistic that we can can uh, put, a, put a lot of capital to work at very good return profiles. And we're hearing, you know, good demand from our customers. Um, and then lastly, just, you know, key operational standpoint, again, I already mentioned, but we want that mark-to-market um, risk removed going forward. So there's less volatility and less um, – risk in the business, and, and we're very excited about uh, getting that completed as well. So that wraps up our, our presentation uh, of the deck, and I think we can open it up for, for questions now. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we'll begin the question and answer session. Once again, to ask a question, you may press star and then one. If you are using a speakerphone, we do ask that you please pick up the handset before pressing the numbers to ensure the best sound quality. To withdraw your questions, you may press star and two. Again, that is star and then one to ask a question. Our first question today comes from Don Sandetti from Wells Fargo. Please go ahead with your question. Yes, um, Chris, on the non-accruals, you know, certainly being up this quarter, it sounds like you expect those not really to materialize into uh, larger charge-offs. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you think those will get worked out versus your historical? I mean, clearly the residential housing market is um, holding up really well, and so I didn't know if there would be, you know, more sales, more refinancing. How do you see that being worked out? Yeah, sure. Hi, Don. Good to good to hear from you. Um, yeah, yeah. I think the you know looking at it, we think it will resolve pretty similarly to how it has in the past. Uh, for sure, in the investor one to four portfolio, you're right, very robust markets, and I would expect um, we'll, we'll historically see that sort of 50-50 divide between refinances and, and folks selling their, their properties. Um, and, and, you know, I think our view is, is that we've tried to help as many folks as we can um, get through that and it will take some time to work off it doesn't it doesn't you know come off overnight so it's going to take you know three four quarters to get to work through that um, but each you know, as each month goes by you, you tend to you know work that backlog off I guess so we think right. it'll be stable but declining yeah so mark um, do you have any thoughts on NIM outlook in the near term? I'm not sure if not accruals have peaked at this point. Yeah, I mean, our focus and the way we're, we take a look at our forecast as well, Don, by the way, hi, nice to hear you again, is, you know, we're thinking that where we're at now, the 16%, 15 16% uh, level is probably, you know, kind of where we're going to peak out and we're going to start to see it actually uh, decline. And taking a look, like, you know, you get one metric on the one slide, it's like the 14.6, whatever. Overall, our entire portfolio is like around 
15.9 in the Q. If you've taken the HFS and HFI loans, we're like 15.9 percent Q2. When we look at the end of July, it's more like around 15.1. So it's it, you know you already start to see some decline, and we think that's going to gradually start to decline. That that would be our forecast. Okay. And then just lastly, as you start to originate again, um, how are you going to pay for those? I mean, obviously you'll get a good advance rates on on the bank lines. But do you have enough cash? I mean, do you expect pay downs? You know, and how material could the new originations be? Yeah, yeah, good question. We're we're going to start slow coming out of the gate. Um, we're not we're not going to you know race back to where we were. So yes, we we have enough capital and cash to do that. Um, we're, we kind of want to test the waters and see you know where demand levels are, and as we resume, um, we'll we'll figure that out. But we we expect to have positive cash flow from from our retained interests um, uh, coming in as well so as we as we go forward we should have capital to to grow the, the originations and then we're also um, in, in talks as I mentioned with some of our uh, investment banks and warehouse providers to to provide financing there as well so the combination of those should give us plenty of room for growth capital uh, thank you Our next question comes from Stephen Laws from Raymond James. Please go ahead with your question. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Chris, Mark, hope you're both well. Good to hear from you. Um, you know, I guess first, you know, I noticed in the deck uh, on page five, it talks about reevaluating product guidelines and offerings. You know, Chris, can you maybe talk about that a little bit? Is, is that, uh, you know, due to uh, performance you're seeing in certain geographies or, or product types in your portfolio? Is it something specific with an outlook uh, of COVID impact? Can you can you give us a little color around the, the the changes being made there? Maybe what you like best more post COVID, and and what products you maybe no longer going to offer? Sure. Yeah, um, we're going to. St- we've been evaluating with the team, looking at you know just our performance and then where we see opportunities. Um, we we definitely see um, more delinquency at lower FICO scores. So initially going out, we're probably going to raise our minimum FICO score. That'll be a key area. Um, and then we've we've looked across the portfolio at property types. Don't see much there. Um, but on a go forward basis, we're certainly going to be careful um, lending to you know. A, a, a property to make sure that the tenants are paying or what's going on with those businesses there. Um, so there will be that will have a little bit of, I would say, COVID feel to it, where we just want to make sure we understand what's really happening at the asset and um, not walking into a mess. Um, and then I think um, that sort of overlays with the geography question as well. Same type of thing, just if there's any specific thing going on in a municipality or, or something like that that we need to be aware of and adjust for. Um, so I think, I think you know, broadly speaking, the, the, we're going to go initially out of the gate with our traditional 30-year product. Um, that's kind of our core button, bread and butter. We won't offer that, that short-term bridge loan right out of the gate, um, but probably add that in um, as time progresses. So it's you know fortunately we have the the earnings coming off the portfolio which sustains us so we're going to just kind of dip our toe back into the water if you will and just and see see how that go. Great, uh, you know Chris, higher level when we think about the business here, you know move to to non market market financing for the new originations and, and certainly I expect that to be you know a higher cost. To, to get that characteristic of those those facilities, you know, securitization markets and what it costs to finance there, uh, and then just heightened risk today. You know, so h- how do you take all those things in and, and think about pricing on new loans in order to, to meet your ROE uh, targets? And, and, you know, maybe how do those, you know, how does that compare to, to maybe where you were with, uh, you know, rates, uh, you know, six or, or 12 months ago? Yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, so the way that we look at it is um, the the lower non-mark to market aggregation facilities really don't have that big of an impact on ROE. Yes, it, it, we have more of a haircut, but we also have lower interest expense during the aggregation period. So it's not a it's not a huge factor, and we think that just the peace of mind and, and the 
structural benefits of those facilities far outweigh any marginal cost. The more important driver for true ROE or IRR on, on any loan that we make is really where we execute in the securitization market. We, th you know, we think we can aggregate fairly quickly and securitize, and, and those economics are much more favorable. Um, so, you know, we think we can we can price product and, and securitize it, you know, with ROEs north of 20% at the margin on, on new stuff. Um, and so we, we work backwards from there, from the securitization exit, I guess, to determine pricing and ROE. Um, and, you know, the, the execution that we saw just in Q2 was very strong, and the markets bounced back, you know, very quickly. And so um, I think, you know, we're being – Conservative about what what those returns will look like, um, but but I think uh, if if securitization markets are where they are today, we'll have very healthy ROEs. Great, that's that's helpful. Thanks very much for that. Have a good afternoon. Thanks you too. Good talking to you. Our next question comes from Steve Delaney from JMP Securities. Please go ahead with your question. Thanks. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the detailed deck and your, your clarifications on, on a couple of complicated things this quarter. Um, as far as the increase in non-accruals, uh, certainly um, 98 basis points. Uh, so we were, we were high, uh, certainly over, you know, the high above, well above the consensus because of, of not factoring in, not applying enough uh, windage to that, I guess I would say. Um, but would you say that I mean, it, it is the increase in the non, uh, non accrual loans to 15. Should we assume like there was really no material impact for floating rate loans in your held for investment portfolio? Is, is that a, a good assumption, Chris? Yeah, that is, that is. Yes. It, just to remember, I would say a very, very large majority of the phone loans are fixed and so is the underlying debt. So, um, there, there should be no interest rate, um, factor at all. It's all related to non-accrual. Great. Okay. Yeah. And that was a meaningful jump, of course, in the quarter. Yeah. You know, there's a accounting has its rules, and then economics at the end of the day, economics rules. Um, the non-accrual interest, okay, that we that you were not able to recognize in the second quarter, as you go through your resolution workout process, um, and we look at you had 102 percent recovery in the second quarter. Uh, I'm, I believe I'm right in assuming that you're not just talking about principal, but you're talking about all interest that you would be due, including possibly some penalty interest. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. I'm sorry, the 102 percent is actually saying we got all of our back contractual principal and interest, and on top of that principal and interest, made a 2% gain or above that gain. because of either prepayment or default interest or whatever, yes. Great, yeah, so not just 102 of principal, but you're, you're entitled, everything you're entitled to um, uh, Plus two, under, right. the, under the deed of trust. Okay, that's very helpful right. because, you know, when you look at the quarter and you look at the trend in, in, in NIM and in spread, you know, it's meaningful, but it's also important to know that this isn't due to you know, just a levered carry trade or something. This is this is something you know that's that's temporarily credit related, but you have a track record of of eventually recognizing you know that that income down the road, or at least at least we'll 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 look at it as you have, certainly have the potential you know to recognize that, assuming you know COVID doesn't doesn't get worse than we think. But thanks thanks for that clarification. That's okay, and that's, and that's why that's why that one slide to your point. You know, the left-hand side is the non-accrual, and the right-hand side is the charge-offs. And to your point, that's the left-hand side, you know, gap accounting, and the right-hand side, the economics. And, and the yep. non-performing is, is high because at 90 days past due, we put it on non-accrual. That's the gap um, kind of industry standard. But if you look at the actual losses that were taken economically, that's the right-hand side charge-off. And you can see it's been historically very low, and it was low for Q2 as well. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. And then on the 214 million loans held for sale at June 30, I know you did a securitization in July, and that had kind of mixed collateral in there. I think um, are the are those are the H um, F S loans still around, or did any of those get pushed into the securitization? Where where do they where you stand on those at this point? 
Yeah, so everything got securitized, Steve, uh, um, <clears throat> and so all of the HF lo HFS loans will move into HFI for Q3, so it'll all just be held as right. HFI. Great. Okay. Very good. So that's we won't have that category, um, you know, going forward. Okay. Great. Right. And, and then my last. To give you a little color yes. there. I'd say uh, I, don't, I don't have the exact number, but a very large portion, probably seventy-five percent or so, were kind of the short-term loans. Uh huh. Um, that's what I'm. So um, they're in that securitization, but I think that, you know our expectation is they'll pay off much faster than than our other core long-term product. Got it. Yeah, okay. the securitization was about what 276 million, and about 215 of that was the short term. So. Yeah, I noticed the ticker had MC, and I assume that did that stand for mixed collateral or something? That's, that's exactly, okay. exactly right. That was, exactly. That was, that was yeah. my guess. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Um, and then lastly, and, and Mark, this may be best handled offline, but but um, with respect to the accounting on the book value impact of the preferred. Um, and your book value being at 1026, um, we had actually taken into account the dilution of, on the preferred if converted and had taken 1247 at March 31 down to 930. So the 1026 is, is not a shock, but is there a, I don't know if there's a simple answer to this, but if let's say the holders of that Series A PREF, Right. decided next week that they were just going to convert to common. Yep. That my question is how much my analysis had assumed 45 million was going to go in and then the 11.7 million shares would be issued. Um, of your 90 million that you're now showing in temp mes equity, and I know that's got that implied dividend built in, yep. is there a number you have in mind that, like, if we forgot about the dividend because they elect to convert, is there a number within that that would go into common equity on an if-converted basis that you can share? Yeah, well, I mean, well, right now, the way, the way the financials show, you know, and you'll see in the queue tomorrow, you've got $90 million in temporary equity and 49, roughly like 48.9 million, 49 million was a deemed dividend that came out of common equity up into temporary. But to your point, yeah. if tomorrow all those preferred shareholders converted to common, yes, that, that entire 90 million would go back down into the, the common stock. So we just took a two, we just took a two dollar plus hit to book value to account for the the future dividends theoretically account for the dividend stream going yeah, forward we, we, for yeah, some we, period of time. We, we took a hit we took a hit to common. Be careful. Not, not say total yes. equity book value, no, to common book value. Because Could, that's right. Hit to common, value. exactly. Yes. So we then after that that twelve forty six or ten twenty six is a common equity. So we took a hit to common equity because you're basically reserving up in temporary equity on the chance that it is at some time put back to the company at the full redemption value. It's like, like a reserve. Once so, they all convert to, to common stock, there is no put right. They can't put the common stock back. That's Unless right. They, that deemed dividend then all goes back into common stock. Okay, very good. So that, that, that $2 loss in book value, if you will, at some point is theor it's theoretically recoverable into common equity. Yes. Okay, that's, that's Great. So the same question I had about the non-accrual interest, uh, you know, we get that back on resolution and this, um, you know, Dean dividend, we potentially get that back as well into, you know, into that's book correct. value. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm good with, I'm good with both of those things. Right. Yeah, and that's what huh? I'm trying to be very clear on this call. That's what I'm trying to be clear on the call as well, Steve, is saying, you know, the gap term is loss per common share of stock. And I, I I have to put it that way because of the gap, but, you know, I it's a loss. There, there was no operating loss in the company. Nothing went through P&L. No cash went out the door. It's a reserve. It's a reserve right. in case something should happen, redemption in the future. But to your point, if the conversion happens, that all goes away and everything comes back into permanent equity. Great. Thank you both for your comments. Sure. Very helpful. Thank you. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star and then one. So with all your questions, you may press star and two. Our next question comes from Aaron Saganovich from City. Please go ahead with your question. Thanks. Uh, in, in terms of the the non accruals that you're seeing, and maybe you already mentioned this, but is, is are, are you seeing any kind of difference in terms of your investor one to four versus the um, other uh, kind of small ticket uh, CRE? 
Hi, Aaron. It's Chris. Um, yeah, I, we 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 saw a slight outperformance uh, on the one to four versus the small commercial, but not not massive and not something that I would call materially different. Um, it's, it's pretty consistent to the the weightings in the portfolio. Okay. Um, and I, I don't know if you have much feel for this, but in terms of the customer base uh, on the on the small ticket CRE, do you do you have a feel for how many of those customers were able to access PPP loans? Um, you know whether or not you know folks are planning to shut doors or keep going. There's been a, you know a lot of discussion about the impact of small businesses from the pandemic. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't. We don't have any data that we can share with you. We 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 do everything kind of at the loan asset level and um, don't aggregate that up all the way to to see trends. Um, in speaking with our our asset managers and the head of our our special servicing team, you know, we're we're seeing everything across the board. We're seeing folks that say, you know, my tenants are put out, are, are literally shut and. And we're seeing people say, "Well, everybody's paying, and, and I'm fine." So it's uh, it's it's kind of too widespread to to report any common theme or that I could give you there or any real data. Okay. Are, are you seeing any um, change in credit trends in through July and into August? Yeah. So through July, as Mark mentioned, we saw delinquency basically stabilize uh, where it was. Um, Got a tick down slightly. Um, the probably well, interesting thing to note, obviously, will be how the rest of these forbearance plans perform. So that the 19% who didn't pay, um, you know, are are going to roll through those delinquency buckets now, and we'll see how they do if they miss that first payment and make it up in the second month, or if they just go straight into foreclosure. We'll have to see how that shakes out, but. Um, so far, um, we've, we've seen it stabilize, and, and we're planning for it to be that way for the next few quarters, and with a slight downtrend as we as we work through these assets. Just based on past experience, um, it takes time to work them off. Okay. And then, just lastly, on uh, you had mentioned dipping your toe in the water in terms of originations. Is, should we expect that? Portfolio to to continue to um, decline as you're as you're originating um, new loans, or do you do you think you'll actually be able to to grow the portfolio modestly? Yeah, we think we'll be able to grow. Um, we, you know, it, time will tell. Obviously, as we get back out there and see see where we are, but I, I think um, our expectation is by Q4 um, we'll be back to a point where we'll see the the portfolio tar start to expand and then. Going forward into 21, definitely see you know real acceleration there. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, at this time, and showing no additional questions, I'd like to turn the floor back over to management for any closing remarks. Uh, nothing else for me. Thank you all for for joining the call, and we appreciate you taking the time. Anything, Mark, you wanted to cover? No, again, just thank you. Very good questions, and I hope the pipe transaction is a little bit out there. It's a little bit out there for us, too, but uh, hopefully we explained it properly for everybody. So thank you for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, we'll conclude today's conference call. We thank you for joining. You may now disconnect your lines.